uh, north and south, midtown Manhattan was a little quieter, so to speak, certainly quieter than it is now. Mm, that's for sure. Uh, so talking about Engine 21, it's in Murray Hill. Um, and, you know, in terms of action, sometimes you go there and I've covered before, and I was talking about this with Chief Pfeiffer last week for my 200th episode. Sometimes you're the black cloud, sometimes you're the white cloud, you know, and those of you in the chat, you know what that means. Which cloud were you? I, I don't know. I think, uh, luckily, you know, as the, the company was not one of the busiest fire duty wise, but my first night, uh, we went around the corner in the middle of the night and we had a tenement flyer on the second floor on uh, third Avenue. And I got a taste of uh, of a fire right away. My first tour in 21 engine and broke the ice. And, and uh, some people wait a long time for that to happen. And I didn't have to wait only a few hours. Do you remember your first time on the nozzle? You know, I don't. And, and it was pretty tough in 21 because it was a senior company. Um, and uh, you didn't get assigned a nozzle too early, and I was promoted uh, uh, 1977. I'm sure I had my turns, especially when we relocated and we caught plenty of work then, either up in Harlem or, uh, or down the Lower East Side. Mm. Um, I do not remember it. It's a long time ago, you must remember. <laughs> We're talking with Commissioner Dan Niger tonight. This is volume 24 of the Best of the Bravest interviews with the FDNY's lead. For those of you watching, if you have a question for the commissioner, I'll try to get to it. And if I don't get to it, don't get mad at me. But I just uh, have a lot of things I want to ask the man tonight. Of course, a 53-year career, you would understand. It. He did a lot, saw a lot. So we're going to talk about as much of it as we can tonight, of course, with him. So, you know, sidebar before I get to Engine 35 in Harlem, it's interesting because Certain guys, as I've covered before, you know, the guys that become bosses eventually on the job don't always aspire to be one. It's kind of something they realize with enough time on the job that it'd be something they'd like to do. Certain guys eye it from day one. Um, either they have experience in the volleys as a boss or it's just something they'd like to aspire to and they can see themselves in that position someday. Which case was yours? Well, I think since my father was a captain, I had it in my head that I should become a captain so that my family wouldn't think, you know, which he was much smarter than I am, but uh, wouldn't be as obvious, you know, he's not as smart as his father. So I really did uh, try very hard to be a captain. And once I got there, the, uh, the rest was certainly easier. The tests, if you study hard for the first few, uh, the other ones aren't too bad. No, of course. But uh, just to go back to 21 engine for a second, you know, when you're working on the fire floor, sometimes an engine man's doing this, sometimes a truck company guy's doing this, you're looking for that hole. And I remember uh, watching the Still Riding documentary on the rescue companies, one and two specifically talking about the late Kevin O'Rourke, who died on 9-11. He was the master at finding the hole. Um, how, you know, how early on would you say you learned how to do that? And what's the key? Because every building's different. Certainly every fire, depending on the material, depending on how it started, is different. What helped you in that specific regard? I've never asked about that before. Well, you know, one thing in, in, in that area on the east side of Manhattan, especially 50 years ago, uh, it was a real mix of whether it was a high rise office buildings, apartment buildings, hotels, uh, and many tenement buildings. Uh, and also we had Grand Central Station. So you, uh, uh, you certainly had a variety and tried to learn as much as you could about each and every type of building because eventually you go to all of them, uh, and we did. So it was a good learning experience. I think um, I think I did learn a lot from members in 21 Engine, from a couple of the uh, lieutenants that I worked with, that were, um, were were really good at good at what they did, who had worked in different areas of the city, and uh, so I think I had a pretty good basis when I got promoted to lieutenant in 1977 and went from midtown to all of So you had eight years by that point when you made LT and you talked about engine 35 being very busy. You know, there's always the aspect of leading by example. I was, I'm a, I'm a huge Ranger. I'm a huge New York Rangers fan, right? We point to Mark Messier often as the greatest captain the New York Rangers have ever had. He knew how to lead his men. It wasn't just what he said. 
but it was what he did once he got out on the ice. And similarly, obviously, to a much greater capacity in the fire department, given the fact that lives are at stake, guys are looking towards you, and they can see right through the BS if they know, yeah, this guy's not really – he can talk the talk, but does he walk the walk? And they can decipher right away if you can or if you can't. And obviously, you have a legacy to live up to. As you said, your dad was a captain, and I imagine a terrific one at that. So how much pressure did you put on yourself early on to make sure you hit the ground running as an LT? And what helped you pace yourself and not psych yourself out as some of us are guilty of doing? I think when you're a young officer in the fire department, you, you do feel the pressure that people are looking at you. And right away, the first fire they go to with you, um, you better show that you know what you're doing. Otherwise, you will, uh, you will not gain their trust. So the pressure's on from day one to be that, that person that members will follow and listen to. Uh, you'll set a good example, and you learn from the people that you work with. So the, the officers that I um, I thought were really top-notch, I tried to be like them. And those that uh, I didn't care for how they operated, I tried to be not like them. So you learn from, you certainly learn from both sides. You say to yourself, that's a person uh, I don't want to be accused of being like, and, and that's a person um, that I aspire to be like. And you uh, you do the best you can, and I think I think the members accept that as soon as they uh, work a few tours with you, and they know you uh, you conduct yourself uh, in the proper manner. And I never I never really had a problem with that. Glad to hear it. This is volume 24, the best of the bravest interviews with the FTNY's elite. I started this mini series last year with Lieutenant Ray Seeley of SOC, you know, another former 288 guy. And here I am with volume 24 tonight with Commissioner Nigro. So it's been quite the evolution and we're happy to have him here tonight. Uh, so, you know, of course, working in 35 as well, there's the dispensing of personnel. Sometimes you're short guys, either guys are on vacation, guys are injured. And it's an interesting thing to manage. Sometimes you'll have de details with guys being brought in. And it's a lot to manage for, especially a new lieutenant at that time, because as I've covered before, not only is it your safety you're looking out for, but it's their safety too. So charging in, you know, because that's the unique structure about the FD, and I'm not knocking the police department, but normally a lieutenant's not going in with a street cop, you know, to a given scene. Usually he's on the outside or she's on the outside. Not the same with the fire department. You're right there with those guys. So tell me about the times in which you had to pull them back. And when did you decipher? Obviously, sometimes it's obvious. But when did you decipher when it wasn't so obvious? Guys, let's step out here for a second. Well, you you know, you try to read the fire conditions. More times than not, it's a chief officer on the outside that's seeing something that you're not. And he's telling us to back out at a, at a certain time. Um, you know, I was lucky when I when I went first went to Harlem. I went to the 12th Battalion. That's what we do. We, we don't get assigned to a unit on promotion. And I had what they call the R group. So I... Did all the units in that battalion, 36 engine, 35, 59 engine, for a little over a year. And you get to know all the members in the battalion, all the officers, they get to know you. So when members get detailed around, you, you have kind of an idea of each and every one of them, who they are and, and how they are. And, uh, and they know they might have worked with you at a number of fires in their own company. So, um, Pretty much, uh, things had to be getting pretty bad up in Harlem back in the 70s and early 80s for us to be backing out. But every once in a while, we had to, and a couple of times uh, just in time before we had a partial collapse in yeah. the situation. And we see the dangers of what a collapse can cause. We saw that tragically earlier this year with Tim Klein. It was a partial collapse, I believe, that caused several injuries to the firefighters with him and ultimately his line of duty death. Uh, at fire at Canarsie, I believe, in Brooklyn. So sometimes with uh, communication on the scene, it's interesting because having a chief there, it's the same thing. Sometimes the chief was charging in uh, with you to a fire. And sometimes these chiefs are assets to the scene. Sometimes there are chiefs, and I'm sure you saw this in your career, that are kind of albatrosses to the scene. And a lieutenant or a captain's right in the middle of that to make sure that, you know, the chief has the necessary information that he needs, but also that he's not negatively impacting what his guys are trying to do at the scene of a particular fire. So as that lifeline, as that go-between at a scene as a lieutenant, you know, what helped you in certain scenes where maybe you had a chief that meant well, but might have been compromising the operation unintentionally? Well, I think our, you know, our structure is such that um, we listen to our bosses, even those that we may not think are the best. Um, 
But the, a chief is a chief, and that person is tasked with the safety of, of all of us. And um, we might disagree and might uh, get on the radio and say, hey, chief, it's uh, we're doing okay in here. We have one more room. We'll be okay. We try to get that message across. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. But the bottom line is, at the end of the day, um, when they say get out, get out. Right. Right. I think there was something, I forget the movie, but it was you salute the rank. If you don't like the man, don't salute the man, but salute the rank or by extension, respect the rank. Uh, of course, of course. Darren, I see your question in the chat. Uh, I'm going to get the, about the merger with EMS in 1996. I'll get to that a little bit later. Because again, quite the journey for Commissioner Nigro, and that is something that we'll definitely touch on because that is such an interesting thing that you were a part of. As you initially discussed, I'm getting salty, of course. Um, so as a lieutenant, you also went out to Division 14 in Queens. Now, I've always wanted to know this. You know, I've heard of the satellite truck, and I've seen it at certain scenes, being a buff, of course, and seeing uh, its operations at times, but I've never quite had an idea of its specific function. So for you, for the audience that doesn't understand by extension, of course, myself, what does the satellite truck actually do? Well, satellites, I think, came out of um, the era of the high pressure. Uh, uh, the department had a high pressure pump where uh, Commissioner O'Hagan then initiated into the department. It was tractor trailer size, and the satellite units responded with it. And what they did, they carried hose and large caliber knobs. So today they still do that. They're really for water supply and for the use of their large nozzles, similar to the ones on a fireboat, but land-based. So if you have a, a large commercial fire, so to speak, uh, you may need uh, more water than the smaller hoses can produce, and the satellite comes, and they, they can supply that water, and they can also supply a very powerful uh, ocean. Thank you for explaining that because I never knew that. So you see, you learn, I'm learning stuff as I go. That's the, that's the benefit of buffing, of course, as I've made a little bit of a podcast out of doing. Um, there's nothing like first do engine work. And same thing if you're in a truck, nothing like being first do and getting there and getting to operate. You know, of course, it's your second do or third do support the companies that are there, but it's always been a little bit of a friendly rivalry, nothing contentious. And the intentions are good. You want to get there. So from the from that time in your career, I know it was a long time ago, what are some of the more notable fires you can recall, or just emergencies in general? It doesn't have to necessarily be fires. Where you were first to? Well, I think, you know, back in the, when I started, it was we counted bells to know where we were going. So a signal came in, you looked at a running board, and it was box 747, and you'd say we're first to. And for the first two companies, the dispatcher would actually call the firehouse, and the, the phone would ring loudly three times just to get your adrenaline. Um, certainly a shock, and you know you had a first do structural fire, uh, jump on a truck. I think anytime you were first do and you were approaching that fire, uh, a memorable one I could think of in eight engine was in the River House in the middle of the night, which is a, a luxury apartment building on the east side of Manhattan facing the river. And as we turned the corner, uh, you could see on an upper floor the fire blowing out 15, 20 feet out into the middle of the street. So it gave you a little time to prepare that this was going to be uh, a difficult job and your first do. And and that's certainly, that's that's part of the, that's part of the job. It's part of the excitement. And um, we did the best we could. It took a, a lot of units to put that fire out, as I recall, and a lot of time. Uh, the apartment was maybe 12 rooms and wrap around the uh, the whole floor. So uh, those types of fires that you remember, um, unfortunately, 9-11 seemed to erase most of my memory of fires because uh, of the, the nature of that particular yeah. job. Uh, everything else paled in, uh, in comparison. Understandably so. So, but you get, you mentioned eight engine and we'll get to that. Now you make captain and you go to eight engine. Now what's interesting about its area. I love talking to guys that worked in midtown because there's so much there besides fires. Yes. You do have your fair share of fire duty in New York city, especially in a compact area like that. 
But it seems like you guys, and I could be wrong and correct me if I am, spend more time on emergencies that don't have anything to do with fire, like car accidents, stuck elevators, even, you know, because there's always construction, a collapse scenario, than you do fighting the fire. So just training for that. Each area presents unique challenges. Just brushing up with those kinds of obstacles and refining your skills to, of course, respond to them adequately. Tell me about what you most enjoyed in that area and some of the more challenging situations besides the fires, of course, that you found yourself in. I think, you know, you pretty much, uh, you pretty much said it. I was assigned when I was promoted to captain in 1982. Uh, I left Manhattan and I was covering in Queens where I lived. And I really couldn't wait to get back to Manhattan. Manhattan was, you know, was what I was used to. A spot opened up an eight engine and I, I asked for it and I received it. The variety that's there, it's an unlimited variety of jobs, not just fires, subway emergencies, but elevator emergencies, like car accidents. So you name it, Midtown Manhattan has it. And the experience that you get there, I always used to advise people when they were getting promoted uh, out of different boroughs, why don't you try Manhattan? You know, really, uh, it, it's, it helps round your career, even if later on you go back to where you're comfortable, or whether it's Brooklyn or the Bronx or uptown Manhattan. But, Midtown Manhattan is uh, is an experience that I would ask firefighters, especially if they're planning to be promoted into the upper ranks, to spend part of their career there and get to know it. And this, it's interesting you mentioned the subway because pre-NYPD Transit Police Housing Police merge, I was talking about this with guys who were in uh, Transit Police, specifically their emergency medical rescue unit. You guys had a lot of man under jobs. Obviously, there's subway fires. And I know not, it's not like this now, but back then, obviously, City, ESU, and FDNY butted heads a lot. But you guys had a really good relationship with the Transit Police's Emergency Medical Rescue Unit, specifically because, as my friend John Bushing, who was in that, you had mentioned, a lot of the stuff that we were doing, it was unenviable. But nevertheless, working with them, I don't know how closely you work with them, but uh, as far as your experiences with them uh, went, uh, whatever the extent of them, how do you feel that helped you in regards to subway emergencies and coordinating with them? Well, I think we learned from one another. Um, at each and every job, you learn something. And, you know, the ESU issue was, a, I think, a short-term uh, problem within the departments where uh, the competition between fire and ESU was sometimes get heated. <laughs> Certainly in my time uh, as commissioner, with Commissioner Brad and his uh, successors, that disappeared, you know, and, and um, it, it's rare now from what, you know, and I, I still talk to people out in the field, it, it, it's rare that those issues arise again. But, you know, transit police was a different, uh, a whole different operation, and we did work with them and um, and worked well. And most of the time we worked well with the police, with rare, with rare exception. Yeah. I, the guys have told me it was really only Manhattan where one truck is and where Rescue One is. And of course, when I say one truck, I'm referring to Emergency Service Squad One. But otherwise, you know, guys in Brooklyn, guys in Queens, they didn't have that problem. They kind of, as you said, they worked relatively hand in hand. And the people of the city were well served because imagine you're in a stuck elevator. You, you just crashed your car and you're waiting for help. You have these two elite units racing to get to you, you know. You can, so as long as you get out of it, it doesn't matter who gets you out. Although, of course, you would be a little bit more partial to the FDNY. You do want to get there first. Of course, best of intentions. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I, of course, I'm partial to the FDNY. But, uh, yeah, yeah they, we had our troubles with uh, the issue. But thankfully, uh, whatever it was, whether it was the members that were there then or between a combination of our members and their members didn't didn't quite mesh. <laughs> but at least, as you said, it's a thing of the past, and I'm glad to see that now. So, you know, I mentioned Rescue One. I don't know how close they were to your company over in Midtown, but it doesn't hurt. And obviously, it's a lot different now with only not only Rescue One, but Squad 18 as well, too. If you're in a pinch and you feel you could use some extra resources, bringing them in. And Rescue One at that time, think of the names. Joe Angelini is there, for example. Paul Hassagan had been there for a little while. These guys had some notoriety. They'd been in Rescue One longer than some guys had even been alive. You get a probie on the job that's 20 years old. You get a guy like Joe Angelini has got 20 years of Rescue One alone. So I don't know how, how often you interacted with them, but anytime there was a job where you felt, let's bring these guys in, tell me about your relationship as a boss with them. Well, I think 
you know, back when I started, 21 Engine was in the battalion with Rescue One. There was no SOC battalion. So Rescue One was in the quarters of 65 Engine. Uh, you might come in on a night tour, 22 years old, and they, you had the detail, and the officer would say, uh, you have the detail tonight, you're working in Rescue One. So that's what you did. Or when I was in Harlem in 35 Engine, uh, the division, Rescue Three was in our division, or up on 181st Street, and get over time, you'd, you'd work in Rescue Three. Uh, and I had nothing but respect. I knew Paul, I knew Joe, and I, you know all of those fellows in Rescue One, and many other companies too. So um, some people, you know, they they have their troubles with them because they're very aggressive, and they think they're uh, you know pushing ahead of them, whether it's the engine or the truck that's at the scene, but. Um, they're there for a reason. They're skilled. They're highly skilled. They're highly motivated, and they are today. Um, the best of the best, I would say, all of our members are are, are brave and, and hardworking. And when things really uh, get tight, the rescue companies will come and get you. Mm -hmm. Greatest fire department in the world, baby. And what's interesting about Rescue One, I, I often steal this line from Joel Kanaski. He said this in the documentary, A Company of Heroes, which is on YouTube for those of you that want to watch it. We ride on a big toolbox. That's the, it, it perfectly encapsulates Rescue One's rig, and by extension, all of the rescues rigs too, because there isn't a tool. Right when you think, who has a tool for this? Because you know, obviously, especially in Manhattan, there's always something that always makes you scratch your head. They have a tool for it. It's amazing. Well, that's the difference. People sometimes ask me what's the difference between when you started 53 years ago and today. That's one of them. I mean, rescue had tools, but nothing like the tools they have today. Nothing like uh, today. They do, as you say, they have a tool for everything and a skill to use that tool. And it's one thing to have the tool. They know how to use them and put them to use quickly. And uh, um, that's part of the magic of SOC now is that they they can really do um, miraculous work. Mm -hmm. And one of them, and uh, John Latanzio, my friend is in the chat, a retired uh, member of the emergency service unit on the PD side. He was in truck three. He was also in the housing police's emergency rescue. John, you read my mind because he mentions the ring cutter. And I remember when I was talking with John Miller last year, he's like, you know, because I know ESU has the same thing. He's like, what is that, a hacksaw for midgets? But again, even something like that, you have a ring on somebody's finger, it's swelling up. You know, rescue comes out, you can cut through that ring, you can get that ring right off. You know, who would have thunk it? But again, a unique city, you got to have unique tools. That's absolutely true. And uh, they, they'll now they have not only they have one, they have rigs are uh, enormous, but uh, they have a collapse rig, they have mm -hmm. the regular rig. So they have they have tools for everything. It's the, uh, the squads, the hazmat unit, we really have. Uh, full array of weapons to use against things that can go wrong here in our city and things go wrong every day. Yeah, no, of course. You know, I, I think it was Mark Twain that once said New York City would be a real nice place if they ever finish it. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, as you said, as long as they're building something or trying to build something in New York and you go to New York now, there's construction here, construction there, construction everywhere. You know, there's always going to be something that's going to keep the FDNYs on its toes. But you guys are ready. You guys are always uh, not reactive, but you're proactive, which I do like about the department. Talking with Dan Nigro, this is volume 24 of the Best of the Bravest interviews with the FDNY's elite. Certainly happy to have the commission on tonight. So you make chief, I believe, around 1988, and you bounced around for a little bit from 88 to 93. And what's interesting is you make chief with 19 years on, uh, which I don't know if that's about the right time. I don't know if guys make chief a little bit later, if they stick around past 20, if that's usually when they get there. But nevertheless, you're still a fairly young guy uh, when you... Uh, Six and um, I bounced around as a battalion chief and a couple of spots that I wanted I didn't get and I ended up uh, taking a detail to headquarters and doing a few uh, administrative jobs at headquarters, which was a great learning experience also. Um, how the people that support the people that are out in the field working, uh, what is it that they do? Um, so I had that opportunity to be chief of personnel, to be chief of health services. And, um, and learned from that. And then I moved on to, a, you know, I was covering up in the Bronx in the 19th Battalion. Before that, I ended up with a spot in Bushwick in the 28th Battalion. And from there, I got promoted to Deputy Chief uh, in the early 90s, which was just another step. Of course. 
And I think I love that you mentioned that because sometimes, you know, I, you hear this on the PD side and the FD side about downtown, right, where the bosses are. Ah, I wonder what's going on downtown. Do they see us? Do they get it? But then you get to downtown. He's like, oh, wow. You know, it's it's one thing to speculate, but you had the benefit of both worlds. You know, you were in you were in the field, obviously, and you were in downtown and downtown. Obviously, and this is no disrespect to the members out on the street doing the work day in and day out. But as you said, they support the members. Their operation is just as vital without downtown. You don't have a fire department. No, and, and you know, I got to know the chiefs of department, Tony Fusco and uh, Bill Feehan. I got to know well, and uh, just that alone um, was worth taking a few years off from firefighting and seeing how the administrative side, was, learning what goes on in their heads, and again, you know, using that later on uh, in my career as an example of. Things to do and things not to do. Uh, you, you bring up Bill Fian, so I have to bring up this story that Tom Von Essen told me a number of years ago. And Tom, if you see this, I'm trying to get you back on the show, pal. You know, get back to me. And, and my best wishes to Tom. He's recovering from a knee operation. Of course, I kid him. I love the guy. But he was telling me that when Rudy Giuliani approached him about becoming commissioner in 96, he's like, I have one condition for you. And Tom says, go ahead, shoot. And, uh, Rudy says, you have to make you have to keep Bill Fian. You can't get rid of Bill Fian. And Tom says, that's the condition. I was gonna beg the guy. <laughs> so, you know, that's how much, you know, that's how much respect that Bill Fian commanded, and rightfully so. I think there was, and I don't know if this is true, it might be an urban legend. He allegedly knew the location of every fire hydrant in New York City, did one Bill Fian. Well, I don't know about that, but I won't dispute it. Um that would <laughs> You know, I don't know how many hydrants there are, but they're in the tens of thousands. Um, he certainly knew more about more things than just about anybody I've ever met. So. No, yeah. Walking, walking encyclopedia of the New York City Fire Department. I have somebody here, Gary Stadler. He's asking this question. I don't know if you were there for this, but he wants me to ask. He says, Mike, ask the commissioner about the telephone company fire back in the 1970s. Well, uh, I was working in 21 Engine that night. Uh, as I said before, 21 engine relocated on just about every all hands north or south of us. So an all hands came in early in the evening and it was uh, five engine first two. Where did the 21 engine go? Five engine. So there we were uh, right around the corner from the phone company. That, um, you know, most times you relocate and you there's a job going on and you're hoping they're going to call you for that job. You know, let's get a piece of this. But after a few hours with this, the way that smoke was, and it was chasing the whole neighborhood out, people were abandoning their apartments. Um, we kept going out on order of smoke calls all over lower Manhattan. People were calling up order of smoke. Um, I don't think any of us working that night were saying, let's get a piece of this job. You know, if we saw a five engine come back, uh, and one of their members who, who nearly died trapped in that sub cellar. Um, it's amazing that we did not lose a firefighter then. We've certainly lost members since um, due to disease, and that's another thing because that um, what was burning there was uh, carcinogenic, and, and not too many people are left alive. I think that fought that fire. Yeah. I remember uh, Danny Noonan, not on this show, but on Salty, he was talking about that. And I think now they have a plaque there dedicated to the members that have passed away since. And now they're taking care of the guys that fought that. And he made an interesting point is you look at now, and our mutual friend Amanda Farinacci wrote about this as well in the New York Daily News, and she was on the show previously. You see all the members from the FDNY alone that have died since 9-11 of not of course, what happened that day necessarily, but what happened afterwards and breathing in all that toxic air. Danny Noonan referred to that as the first 9-11, not in terms of his death toll, obviously, but just in terms of that, breathing in that toxicity, obviously not having the equipment back then that you guys have now. A lot of guys didn't realize what they were breathing in. No, it's quite similar, you know, and I think early on the department was putting a red star on the medical folder of people that they knew that had responded there whatever good that did but um so many of them danny included got sick you know, from yeah. the event at that fire and uh having been around the corner i can say um i don't know i, I really don't know how we didn't lose multiple people at that fire it's a 
it's a miracle that that very night it's a miracle but what happened afterwards is a terrible tragedy yeah uh, john latanzi will bring this brings this up in the chat i i don't know if it was in manhattan or if it was in brooklyn jog my memory wall bombs in 1978 he says was also a game changer was that in brooklyn or manhattan that was in brooklyn okay you know that was really uh, alerted us to the dangers that we we probably knew a little bit about of trust roofs and um after that fire i mean everyone had rabbit ears for trust roof does it have a trust roof does it have a trust roof? So we had a bunch of people operating uh, on this roof that collapsed they dropped them into the fire uh, and it was a it was a terrible loss of life. So that was that was a Brooklyn fire. And um, after that, so much was written about trust roofs, and every firefighter in the department, um, especially every chief officer, was uh, very alert to building with trust roofs. Of course. Before I continue with your career, because I want to get to Division Three, so you had a brief spell there uh, in the mid '90s. You know, there is the aspect of burnout, no pun intended. You see so much, and it's a great job, but it beats you up, not just physically, but mentally. And now we're seeing an onus put uh, on mental health of first responders, taking care of them, making sure that we hear them out and that they don't feel like they're alone, because you really do see some stuff that nobody should ever have to see. What was the key for you to, to decompressing during your career and knowing when to take a break? What was What were your outlets? Well, I, you know, I always had a a close family and good friends and uh, you know, I'm a regular church goer. I don't know if that counts, but um, I, I always have things to go back to. I think um, the department, it takes its toll. And years ago, uh, nobody talked about that. Nobody would admit that they were um, bothered by anything. And I think the first time uh, I was still chief at health services at Happy Land, we had just put together a team of peer counselors you know we had a small counseling unit and Malachi Corrigan ran it for many years and uh, he trained some firefighters to counsel other firefighters and they responded up to the Bronx and responded to the kitchens and that started um, the expansion of the counseling unit to what it is now really a it's a resource for the whole country. We've sent, we send our counselors around the country when something and uh, it's a tremendous resource. And it really grew out of, uh, it grew out of that. The need was seen thanks to uh, Mal Corrigan and, um, and people willing to do it. Uh, you ask people to really step out of their comfort zone when you ask them to be a, a peer counselor, but we had some folks willing to do it. And, um, it's been going strong ever since. Everybody's different, but I think it's good for not only the count counselee, if that is a word, and if it's not, I just made one up, uh, it, but also for the counselor, because sometimes when you hide that away, it's, it's as you said, it's stepping out of your comfort zone. Whatever happened to you, it's not easy to talk about it. But the more you talk about it, the more you face it head on. And of course, with the passage of time, maybe that makes it easier. It really does end up helping both parties. And I think that that was especially born out of 11 to where... You know, I remember a firefighter who was involved in the Charleston tragedy back in uh, 2007 where they lost nine guys, I think also at a supermarket fire. Uh, no, it was a mattress store, actually. You know, they sent some personnel to the FDNY down there, and these guys had been through 9-11. And so naturally they felt, okay, you understand us. And even though you'd rather these things not happen to begin with, at least if they do happen, that is one of the silver linings, just the counseling and the fact that the members don't feel like they're abandoned or alone. They have somebody that knows that pain firsthand. Yeah, it's, um, you know, sometimes some people won't, um, won't open up except to their brothers and sisters within the department. Mm -hmm. Other people have no problem going to other types of professionals, but um, at least it's a good start to, to start with peer counseling and perhaps they'll guide you in a direction when they see that you may need more extensive work to get past, especially after 9-11. Some people never really got past that. No, how could you? This day. No, uh, and I don't blame him. I do have a question in the chat from Joe Maliga, and it's perfect because I did want to ask about this, Joe. You read my mind as well. 
And there, are there heavy days on the job? Yes, but they don't call it the greatest show on earth in New York City for nothing. There's a lot of funny days, really a lot of great happy days. And so he says, other than promotions, he stole this question from me, but I'll forgive him. What do you remember as a happy day? I think, you know, I just read somewhere recently, nobody ever says, I wish I would have spent more time at work, except firefighters. So, you know, firefighters go to work early. Uh, they get there sometimes an hour or two before they're supposed to. Um, they don't rush out at the end of the tour unless, uh, you know, they're coaching Little League that night or something. And um, each and every tour has something in it that will bring a smile to your face. Um, members, everyone thinks they're a comedian. And uh, <laughs> You do hear some funny stories and some funny jokes. Um, enjoy having meals together. It, uh, it, the work environment for firefighters is it really is. I mean, even after 9-11, somebody gave me a framed plaque, and it said, still the greatest job on earth, you know, which I have hanging in my house. And you know, even after that, people were saying, it's still the greatest job on earth, and people feel that way today. So I think. The happy days uh, certainly outnumber the sad days. The sad days are uh, the saddest of the sad. You know, we lose we lose our, our fellow firefighters. You know how many times I've had to, you know, tell a family member that their uh, son or daughter had died. There's nothing nothing harder than that. You know, that was. If you want to ask what's the hardest part about being fire commissioner, that's it. Delivery message like a mother or father or um, husband or wife uh, nothing yeah. nothing more difficult than that but um thankfully that doesn't happen every day and, and the good times come quite often and there are guys that'll do 40 years they don't want to leave and you'll have guys, I, I remember, you know, somebody said this the other day, they did about 32, 33 years. They feel like they left too soon. And to your point, how many people say that? How many people can honestly say that? I, I tell people, people say, how's retirement? I, I joke, I say it's overrated. But, <laughs> you know, when I retired, I had almost 33 years the first time. And I really never got it out of my system. Which is why I can't. Of course. No intention of retiring uh, at that age. And... So, so there it was, but I tell people don't rush into it. You know, don't, you know, don't say, well, I got a lot of overtime this year. I'm going to get out. You know, get out when it'll hit you when it's time. You know, either physically you can't do it anymore, and that's more often than not the reason to leave. Um, the job is extremely physically taxing. And one of the probies, uh, when I was commissioner, you know, people have to say why they're not finishing probie school, why they quit. And he said to me, uh, he didn't realize it was so physical. And I was wondering what, what he missed, you know. You, you really didn't realize being a firefighter was physically taxing. You've never seen firefighters at work. You live in New York City. Uh, I, anyway, um, it takes its toll on all of us. And... Uh, more often than not, that's either you know you have an injury, you have to leave, or you know it's time when you can't make that sixth floor and, and uh, you're dragging behind the other members and you say, you know, it's time. Unless you're Ray Downey and you can just breathe smoke for days. Ray and have your <laughs> But human, you know, I, I tried to keep up with him up to the 20-something floor at the Macaulay Culkin fire and it was a job to stay. He was a little older than I, than I was at the time. It was a job, a job to keep up with him. He almost, he, he, he was quite the physical specimen, right? There's a story, and I had The Last Man Out by his nephew, Tom, which is a great book, uh, over in front of me on my bookshelf. And there's a story in there. I think it was either, I want to say it was Joe. I think Joe was the captain of squad 218. If I have that wrong, somebody correct me, might have been Chuck. But I think it was Joe. And it, it, by this point, Sock was just, you know, it just been formed. This is like 98, 99. And Joe is following his dad down the hallway. And he's coughing, he's putting his mask on. And he's hearing his dad bark out orders clear as day. He looks up, his dad doesn't have a mask on. You know, that dude, he could, smoke was nothing to him. Talk about an iron lung. God. 
tough guy. I worked yeah. with him. I was in the 2-8, and he was a captain of rescue, too. Um, I was always happy when we had a, a job, and, I, and right now he came in. Um, you, knew you, you knew what you had right there. Mm-hmm. Last note on him before I get back to your career. Uh, they were calling uh, his son. I think this is also Joe. They were calling him Jesus. And he's like, thank you, Paul Rogers. He, he yeah, he's squad 18. He, squad 18, it was Joe. They're calling him Jesus. And he's like, why are you calling me Jesus? One day he just went to him. He's like, why are you guys calling me Jesus? It's like, well, you're the son of God, aren't you? Because for those of you that didn't know, <laughs> they called Ray Downey the rescue God. And they later on, they just shortened it to God. You know, they never said that to his face. But behind his back, with love, of course, they would always call him that. So. It's a little, that's how much respect they had for the man. So 93 to 94, like I said, in division three, and you guys, I feel in downtown are always rewriting the blueprint. You have to stay ahead, especially in a city like New York that you were saying, you never know it's, what it's going to throw at you on a given day. 93, you get the trade center bombing. 94, you get, this wasn't a terrorist attack, but it was a guy, you remember the Eddie Leary case in the four train in Fulton street firebomb. So these emergencies naturally cause one to re-examine the tactics. Not that the tactics are faulty, but it's like, okay, we had this. We did well here, but what else can we do to make sure, God forbid, we have something like this again, we can do even better. As a chief, how much of a hand did you have in looking at plans and evaluating, you know, member response and member duties at such large-scale emergencies like this? I think, you, you know, you were, you were constantly reviewing the policies, and when something happened that was – that we had a policy for, but maybe the results were not exactly what we thought it could be. Uh, we'd go back and take a look. And we had so many um, smart people in the department where you could assign somebody, hey, this is this is something we'd like you to look at. And uh, Ronnie Spatafora was one, you know. We said, hey, Chief, there's uh, they're putting these antennas up on the roofs, these cell phone antennas, and they're causing us problems. Okay, well, one of you take that as a project and, and let us know how how we can do a better job with that and, and they'll they'll take it on you know? so we have no shortage of those those folks willing to uh, really take a deep dive into this changing world that we're in you know that, um, you know now you know, now with the street curbside dining and the rigs can barely fit how are we gonna how are we gonna place the ladder trucks and what can we do to uh, uh, to still to still be viable in this environment that's certainly not going to change with the e-bike batteries now we're working real hard on on that issue um it's not going to go away and, and how can we um what can we push forward to ask the legislators to make some changes so that the public can be safe from these fires that have taken lives already yeah. If no changes are made, they'll take more. Of course. I have, before I get to 1996 and the EMS merger, I've had these photos in the shoot for a while. And I'm going to show them here. It'll probably jog your memory, bring back some good times. Uh, one of them is uh, you and Pete here at the scene of a fire in the mid 90s. You were chief of operations by this point. You know, uh, so I, th I don't recall the job here. There's you and, uh, of course, Pete and the Commissioner Fian as well. And what I love about this is that in this particular photo, here you are, a chief of department, uh, and this is right after 9-11, of course, in the early 02. And it doesn't matter, you know, what the rank is, as we were talking about earlier. You know, you're charging in right with those guys. Here's here's a, a chief uh, right here in Gansey, chief of department. Doesn't necessarily have to be there. He's there as a command presence. You would think he'd be downtown calling up and seeing what's going on. No, there you, there you go. I'll pull it up again. There are two you uh, guys are with a high rank right there with, uh, you know, just as involved as any probie would be. You had all you could do to keep Pete out of the building. <laughs> Trying to make the rescue of the Father's Day fire. He was wearing deck shoes and, uh, and Bermuda shorts and a golf shirt and uh, crawling into a hole. Um, you know, he, he, Pete, was, uh, Pete was a fireman at heart. No matter what rank he was, uh, he was a firefighter and, and um, a, good, a good friend. We, we worked well together and... I'm not even sure what fire that was, but it's a good yeah. time capsule. Wow. Yeah. And of course, here's you as commissioner. Same thing in that bunker gear, rocking it as usual. Uh, there's you, I believe. Uh, yep. Right off to the side on the pile. And I love this one. This is you. This is a great one. You, Von Essen, uh, Chief Gansey, and, and Billy Fian. That must have been some time in the mid 90s. You know, yeah. uh, the, uh, 
sure, late 90s, uh, not sure, was it the Pete's promotion or when? He's got the five stripes, that's for sure. Yep, yep. And there you are standing tall, beaming with pride as well. Uh, so, you know, that said, we'll get to 96 now. And I brought this up before, but it was interesting because a lot of people don't realize I spoke with Phil Pulaski off there, who was en ended up later becoming the NYPD chief of detectives. And that guy, you know, very smart guy, was an engineer. Uh, and he had a bit of a medical background, I think, too. I said, Phil, did you guys almost, because if you go out to Nassau County, there are ambulance corps under the police. I said, I know you guys took, obviously, housing and transit the year before. I said, did you want EMS as well? And he's like, yeah, we tried for it, but ultimately, you know, we didn't want to foot the medical bill. So we let the fire department have it. And I, I got the perspective of Zach Goldfarb, who you know quite well, uh, as well on that merge. It's a difficult thing because, you know, much like housing and transit with the NYPD, EMS has their own way of doing things. Some people are looking forward to the merger because now there's new career horizons. Some people are not because they're of the mindset. And I can't blame them. We've been doing this for how long now? It's working just fine. Live and let live. But you get it. And now you have a whole new bureau under you. And now there's CFRD runs that are increasing in nature. And you have the issue of not only personnel, but morale. But they tapped you as the guy to get EMS under the FDNY banner and inculcate EMS into the FDNY family. How difficult a task was that? And by the time 97 came around, you had a year of it underneath your belt. Looking back on, you know, the first time it merged, how'd you feel? Well, I'd have to say it was uh, one of the most difficult things I've ever had to do. Um, it was, people call it an arranged marriage, a shotgun wedding. Um, neither side really wanted any part of it. This was a decision made by City Hall. Uh, EMS was under HHC. They had EMS. Um, their apparatus wasn't very good. Their ambulances, their response time wasn't very good. Um, and the mayor saw the merger with fire and the use of firefighters to respond to calls, the most serious call, as a way to improve the EMS system, which it has. You know, there's double the number of people in EMS right now. You'll still get. You know, the, uh, and I get it, the old timers who uh, started out in the green, they call it the green and white uh, EMS folks that uh, call it the ruination of EMS. But, and some of the firefighters back in the day wanted no part of these medical calls. Today, every, uh, just about everyone uh, came into the department after the merger. Certainly, most of the firefighters, uh, many of them. Out of EMS, were EMTs uh, before they were firefighters, so it's second nature to them to go on these medical calls. But I think we've saved um, more lives. It's a tough thing to say. More lives from medical calls, our firefighters, have, than from fires over the past 25 years. Mm -hmm. Our uh, fibrillation and uh, CPR. Uh, wound control and all the other things firefighters can do before the arrival of EMS at times. And um, the people of the city benefit from it. And we saw it uh, just before I left that tragic fire in the Bronx. I've said often that without the hard work of the firefighters and EMTs and medics at that job, we would have lost twice that number. People were brought out of that building um, not breathing. They, they, were, they were dead. And they were miraculously brought back to life by you know, hard work of firefighters, EMTs, and paramedics. It was amazing what they did. So um, I think EMS is better for it. The fire department is certainly better for it. Uh, there's still a distance to go, though. I, I don't think it's a, it's still a work in progress. It still could be better. Um, and we'll see where it goes in the next few years. I can't imagine, you know, I, I sometimes you see it in these science fiction movies. There's an alternate universe. I can't imagine uh, EMS being under the NYPD banner. You know, it would it'd be so weird. I know they have emergency service has their own ambulances, but that's for injured and unfortunately deceased cops. But, you know, you guys, even though obviously there's, as you said, there's still hurdles to go. It's turned into a great operation, you know, and it's something that now firefighters are so used to it. I mean, there's some of the old generation that, as you said, may not, may, may still not be a fan of it, but new firefighters coming in now, it's it's almost a part, it's a rite of passage because as you said, EMS, if you want to be a fireman, for some is a stepping stone. And I love that because now 
they're not looking down on EMS. They realize it's just as important. Yeah. I mean, we have chief officers in the department who were were EMTs, Mm -hmm. you know, quite a few. So I think uh, I always had a lot of respect. I did a few tours when I became chief of EMS on the ambulance, and I saw right away how hard that job is, how difficult an eight-hour tour on an ambulance anywhere in the city, uh, wherever I rode, uh, how, how much of a strain that is and how difficult it is. So um, I have nothing but respect for the members and what they do. And um, I say, you know, there's, there's certain things you see on the television shows where the ambulances are in the firehouse and it's a little bit different world in New York City. Uh, we're lucky we can fit the fire engines in. And, uh, you go to a rescue one you mentioned before you have to you have to slide in between the uh between the wall and the, and the rig just to get into that firehouse over there. Um, but i i think the city will continue to make it better we'll, and we'll see what the future brings certainly with uh, the pay scale for ems i think that will have to be something that is addressed uh, in the very near future it's interesting, of course, the uh, paradox, because you, where I'm at in New Haven, Connecticut, drive by a fire station is exactly what you said. The ambulance that the New Haven Fire Department has, and they have quite a few of them, is housed with the fire apparatus. You know, But you go to New York City, like you said, it's such a small, compact city. You're just lucky enough to get the rig in there. You have to have separate EMS stations. Um, we do before. Go ahead. Combined, one is in Staten Island and one is down in Rockaway. Mm-hmm. They're relatively new stations. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's at least at least they're there, and you know these members. We wish them the best, especially after the last two years. God, you know, talk about earning your stripes. They definitely did that uh, during the height of the COVID pandemic. Before I get to your chief of operations stint, um, Stu Kelso also submits a question, and he says, "When EMS was joined to the FDNY initially in 1996, was there a detriment of any sort to the financial resources for the FDNY?" Um, not really. I think it was well funded. It was. You know, the idea came out of City Hall. It came from Mayor Giuliani, his administration. It was funded. Um, so I, I don't see that it ever really affected, you know, the reason firehouses were closed, so to speak. It wasn't like, we need this much extra money for EMS. Let's close five firehouses. Or as Michael Bloomberg would, I think, all through his administration, I was on the outside at that time, but it, uh, every budget request was close 20 firehouses. And every year, uh, the city council overrode that. And, and that until finally, they did close five, I think, at the end of his, at the end of his administration. Yeah, around 2013. Um, so, you know, around the mid-90s, you became chief of operations. And that's an interesting, you know, evolution for you, because around this time, as I mentioned earlier, in 1998, Ray Downey's brainchild finally comes to reality with Special Operations Command, where you guys take seven engine companies, turn them into squads. Now it's eight with Squad A on Staten Island, but originally it was seven. So now you have these engine companies that are hybrids. Not only are they first two engine companies, they also function as hybrid rescue companies, too. And that's under your purview. EMS, obviously, under your purview. And they combine all the other engine and truck companies throughout the city. And that is taunting. So tell me about your day-to-day as Chief of Ops. Well, I think it was a fantastic opportunity to be second in command to my friend Pete Gansey. So um, I couldn't say uh, every day uh, having a chance to work with him and for him um, was a blessing. And it it is a uh, biggest fire department. I think Tokyo is bigger than us, but the area of Tokyo is large. So. you know, we are the busiest, the largest fire department, 17,000 people in the fire department. At the time, operations had just about everything under it. So you were, uh, you had a lot of responsibility, but, I, you know, you have people working. We had a good structure, whether it was the, the divisions, the battalions, the boroughs, uh, and everyone else helping out. Um, it was It was a great job. Until September 11th, then it wasn't so great. But um, I think we made 
did a lot of good things in those years. Tom Von Essen was uh, he he and Ray did the squads and, and the hazmat unit and, um, just added to the abilities of the department to meet the many uh, various emergencies and types of fires that happen in the city. Mm -hmm. It also helped the rescues because the rescues do so much and to have squads there with capabilities uh, similar to that of the rescue, it also significantly helps the rescue. Let's say they're at, already at one call as it is, you know, they're not worried about the borough potentially being uncovered for that duration of time. Because, for example, if you're in Queens, rescue four is out doing something. All right. Well, then have 270 do it. All right. Or have 288 do it as an example. And sometimes these companies are even acting as some of the rescues when the rescues are unavailable. There's a video on YouTube, Squad 252, acting as Rescue One has their rig parked in Rescue One's quarters, which is amazing to me. That happens. You know, that uh, it's creative uh, dispatching, and it can cover sometimes um, these rescues are out for a considerable period of time, more than one rescue at times. And uh, the squads pick up that slack, so to speak, and... Uh, again, serve the public in a in a way that's didn't happen 50 years ago when I started. As as busy as everyone was and as good as everyone was, uh, the training today is uh, is better. The tools are better. So the ability of of the department to get things done is better. Imagine telling telling a probie Nigro in 1969 what the department would have today. I'm pretty sure your jaw would have dropped. You probably would have thought that somebody was crazy for telling you that, that they would smoke or something. I mean, we spent hours in proby school learning how to use the ax to cut a roof. I haven't seen that in a while. So, <laughs> uh, different job. How to use a life net, how to use a scale. These things aren't even on the rig anymore. Mm -hmm. It's been a long time. Considerably better. No, of course. Your experience on 9-11 is well documented. For those of you in the chat that have not seen Commissioner's, uh, the Commissioner Nigro's interview with uh, Getting Salty, watch it. He goes really in depth on what he experienced that day. I don't want to make you relive that here. But just a quick note on that. I remember you saying that you told Pete on the way down there that you knew you weren't going to be able to put the fire out because of how big it was and obviously how far up in Tower 1 it was is before the second plane hit. But I'm curious, you know, I remember having Mike Penn on the show was Lieutenant in Rescue 2 later on and in Rescue 1 as well. And he talked about how the size up process for a fire starts before you even see it. Once the call comes over the air and you're hopping on the rig, the guys are talking about, OK, when we get here, we're going to do this, that and the other thing. It's different here because from wherever you were in the city, you just about be able to see the towers. Didn't matter if you were in Staten Island and Brooklyn. They were so visible at 110 stories. Of course, they would be. It's so. Over. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, when you first laid eyes on that tower, but again, before plane number two came in, besides what you told Pete initially, what else was that? What, what else was said in that conversation on the way down there? Well, I, you know, I said it's going to be the worst day of our life. You look up, you see 10 floors. I've been to high rise fire, but then I never saw 10 floors of fire in a high rise building um, in the upper floors of that where we weren't going to reach it with a outside streams. So the thought of putting the fire out, and I didn't even know about anything about the standpipe yet, um, we weren't going to put it out. So the plan really was to try to get people up to maybe get a stairway open for the people above, because the calls were coming in fast and furious from those people above the fire. You know, we're trapped. Um, our job is to try to get, get to those people somehow. And you get some semblance of that plan from the audio tapes that were found later from the South Tower. Yeah. When the members got up to the to the sky lobby um, and were just about to try to get up a clearer stairway to get above, to get above the impact area when that building came down. So that was really uh, what we could do, you know, and, people that were below there's many handicapped people in the building get them out of the building um, and that's what we that's what we did but putting the fire out um, we were concerned about localized collapse we had seen that in high-rise buildings before where you had partial floor collapses with very heavy fire but um, no one I spoke to thought I think these buildings are going to come down like they did 
matter of seconds. Yeah, to your point, I think Tom Von Essen said this to me as well. He's like, was the thought there that they come could, that they could come down? Yes, because if fire is burning for such a at such a high rate, obviously it could make a structure unstable. Maybe eventually they could have came down. But to your point, did anybody think they would come down in 102 minutes? No, I I, I don't think that anybody thought that they would come down that quickly. Um, and unfortunately, they they did that day. Uh, and you're referencing, of course, Chief Palmer, and uh, as well as uh, Ronnie Buka from the fire marshals, who was formerly in, in one of the rescues. I think he was in Rescue 1. Yeah, he was in Rescue 1. They I got up that high. Rescue 1. They formerly yeah. in Rescue 2 when I was there, yes. Yeah, they, they got up pretty high, uh, you know, and you could hear that on the radio transmissions, and they gave their lives heroically, those men. Um, you know, I will say afterwards, of course, you became chief of department with the death in the line of duty of Chief Gansey. Uh, you discussed why you retired initially with my friends on Salt Team. Watch that. He goes into depth on that as well in 2002. And you were away for a while. Um, you know, I'm curious. You know, you it's it's a difficult way to leave. Nobody wants to exit on that note, losing so many good people in one day. Um, what did you do in those dozen years that you were away before you came back as commish? Well, uh... I did a little consulting work, uh, did some public speaking. I um, enjoyed my time off. I say I missed the department, but you're retired, you're retired. So uh, we did some traveling. I, I traveled many, many times to, uh, two times to France, many times to Italy, certainly Florida here in the U.S. <laughs> and enjoyed time with my family. Not a bad way to spend it. Not a bad way to spend it at all. So you come back as the 33rd fire commissioner in 2014. And the, the fire department that you left in 2002, we talked a lot about the evolution of the FDNY tonight, right? The fire department you left in 2002 is so different than the fire department you returned to in 2014. I imagine that first day as the fire commissioner, you walked into your office, you had to look around at the operation and say, holy crap, in a good way, of course, you guys have come a long way. Tell me about getting reacclimated to such a different, more well-rounded, really high-speed department, one that really adapted well to the 21st century. I, I think it uh, a tribute to the members in that interim period that you know, took on these various roles, especially for uh, chief officers and some of our, uh, our civilian uh, personnel, personnel managers, um, that on themselves to move the department forward, whether it's with technology, whether it's with tactics, whether it was expanding training, uh, all of these things really were improved. I think we realized with the McKinsey report after 9-11 that there were certain things we could have done better. Um, and, and the members corrected many of them. Now, as commissioner, my role, you know, your, your role was more uh, administrative and encouraging the chiefs from the chief of department on down to um, continue the work that they were doing of, uh, of making the changes in the department that makes us more efficient. So um, the technical part of it, uh, I left to them. I never tried to be a fire chief as commissioner. I never responded to a fire and said, uh, Step aside, you know. I think I'll I'll take command here. That's not the role of, of fire commission. Even fire commissioners like myself, or Sal Casano, who you know were chief of department at one time. Uh, your role is is different. Just, you can observe, you can see who who may be uh, more efficient, who's who's the best for this role and who's the best for that role. But um, don't try to be the chief officer, you're the commissioner. It's a different role. You read my mind because I was just about to ask you about that. You mentioned Sal Cassano, another one. Come on the show, Sal. I would like to have him on, of course, and hopefully maybe this is the interview. Together. What was that? We were in probate school together. Yeah, good man, Sal. Interesting career for him, too. You know, uh, he was chief of the department. Then, as you said, you're right, he became commissioner upon the retirement of uh, Nick Scapetta in 2010. Um, you know, and again, you guys in the chat are reading my mind tonight too. It's like you guys got ESP on me because I was going to ask this too, but I'll borrow it from you guys. What is one thing? Oh, this is a two-part question. What is one thing in your eight years as commissioner that you were 
proudest of implementing? And what is one thing that you look back on and you say, man, I wish I could have implemented that? Well, I think the departments, I guess there's a few things that I could say. Uh, I, I certainly came back and was in favor of making the department more diverse. And it was much more diverse when I left than it was when I started as commissioner. So I, I take that as a, uh, many people wouldn't, but I, I take it as, a, as an achievement. And the other was the way the department responded to COVID uh, held together, uh, even in times when our medical leave was such that we didn't know we could we could put all of our units in service, and we did. And uh, and our people kept coming to work, and they kept getting sick and getting better and coming back to work. We did lose some. Uh, each and every one of the losses was a terrible tragedy. But the department, um, I mean, the EMS folks you know, what they had to do day in and day out, and our firefighters also, um, but certainly EMS uh, throughout, and still today, but not certainly not like it was in the early days when we, one day we had 7,000 calls and uh, 7,000 medical calls. It was just, uh, and, and they did it. So uh, I'm proud that the department did not, uh, so it did not lose its ability to respond to everything else that was going on in the city, even while uh, COVID was, was really taking its toll on the public and on the department. Yeah. So before I get to the concluding segment, of course, you retired recently, earlier this year. And a solid eight years as commissioner, of course, COVID was a unique emergency because it wasn't like 9-11 where you knew who the enemy was, you knew what had happened, and maybe had an idea as to where they were and how to respond. This was really, I think, Chief Terry Monahan of the uh, NYPD, chief of department at one time for the NYPD, said on this show, it's the invisible bullet, you know, and that it's a perfect description of it. Um, but even then, as you said, the FDNY managed it as best as they could. They emerged on the other side of it, all the more wiser, all the more stronger. And you leave. You talked about knowing when it's time. When did you first start thinking, you know what? You know what? I, I finally got out of my system. I finally had enough. It's time to go and enjoy the rest of my life. I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's out of my system yet, but I think, <laughs> you know, you can look there's a, uh, across from the commissioner's office. There's uh, photos of every commissioner, 33 photos. So if you look at the dates, you'll see that none of them um, – go to another mayor. So they're appointed by a mayor, whether it's um, next to Petter. Um, he, he could have stayed another four because Bloomberg did 12 years, but uh, when a new mayor is elected, the new mayor brings in a new commissioner. So I had it in my, at the end of the year, um, I would leave, you know, the mayor would name a new fire commissioner, but he didn't. So there I was, you know, in January, I was still a fire commissioner. And finally I said, you know, I'll stay around, but let me know what's, you know. And it wasn't likely that I was going to be asked to stay around. So I said, fine, you know, here's my 30 day notice and uh, I'll leave in mid February. I think I've uh, done my time. And here we are in mid August and there still isn't a fire commissioner. So that's that. But, um, I, I'm fine with, with having what I, I never thought I would do more than um, the mayor's Mayor de Blasio's term because that's what everyone else did. Right. I if I would I would have pulled the uh, Tom Von Essen on Bill Fee and I would have bet to stay. <laughs> I would have first thing I would have did is march into your office. Can you please stick around? How much do I have to pay you? Uh, you know, to stick around. And oh, I have to do a word here from my good buddy, uh, Lou Animone. This is a blast in the past, my friend. He just said, uh, Chief Lou Animone, hi, Mike, and hi to Commissioner Nigro. Uh, Commissioner Nigro, comment on secret re recommendation to Port Authority uh, to, to lock the roof doors at World Trade, at the World Trade Center after February 26, 1993. I don't know if how much, well, you were chief at the time, but he wants to know about that, this Chief Animone. Well, I'm not sure. Uh... I guess Lou is thinking that they could have uh, 
taken people off with helicopters. Perhaps they could have. Um, I, I don't know. You know, people were on the, the building collapsed. If you were on the roof, you would have collapsed with the building. Um, I'd have to ask aviation if they really believe they could have uh, landed on that roof and taken people off if people got into the roof. You know, the Port Authority operates and still does outside of the purview of the city building code and, and rules and regulations, uh, much like uh, state or federal buildings. So uh, the department has no control over that. We can make recommendations and generally they're agreed to, but we can't set the rules for the Port Authority. Yeah, Port Authority is an interesting agency with how they function. You kind of hit the nail on the head there, but good to see you, Chief, and I'm glad you popped up in the chat tonight. I'll see you soon. He'll be back on the show in November. More on that as we get closer. Uh, just one more thing before I do get to concluding segment. You know, I do look at what Ms. Cavanaugh is doing there, and she's hanging in. I mean, she had obviously the line of duty death of uh, Mr. Klein, and that's not easy to deal with. But I feel like in the six months that she's had the post, she's getting by as well as she possibly can. And how often do you say you keep in touch with her? Um, once in a while, but she, you know, she was my, uh, you know, she was there when I got there. She, she's very smart, very hardworking, uh, quickly went up and, and when Bob Turner retired, unfortunately, um, I named her as first deputy because I thought she was very skilled and could do the job. And anytime I went away, she was acting commissioner. And, um, certainly as you say, in these six months, she has done everything, um, He's been asked to do and done it well she um that was actually the night i left like five minutes into her first term she had a line of duty death mm. i mean the hard right could not write that and I, I i was home i was like should I, I i was tempted to respond but i couldn't you know i said it's, you know it's not right you know she's now the commissioner so um i just felt Wow, what a burden to place on her five minutes into becoming a uh, fire commissioner. And she, but you know, she's been there before. She's been with me at all the line of duty deaths, and she's you know, she can do it. She certainly proved it. I think that was uh, Lieutenant Gahard, who, who, or Firefighter Gahard, I should say, uh, that died of a heart attack uh, and the Rockaways after fighting the fire. First night on the job. Yeah. First night on the job. Well, this has been a lot of fun, uh, but stick around. We got to end on the rapid fire. Now it's going to get tough. You can say pass if you want, but it's five hit and run questions for me, five hit and run answers for you. Are you ready, Commissioner? Sure. All right. First, favorite tool on the rig? The tool that puts out the fire, the knob. <laughs> Not a, <laughs> that's a good answer. A lot. So many guys tell me Hurst, her ESU and FDNY, like the Hurst tool, the Hurst tool, the Hurst tool. That's a different answer. I like second, you worked in a lot of the boroughs. Hey, a borough to work in. Well, I think it's obvious. Uh, 21 engine, eight engine, 35 engine, third division, Manhattan. There you go. Not a bad answer either. Third. And this is why I say, if you, you can say pass if you want in the event that it's not G rated funniest call you ever responded to. Well, usually our, what we consider funny calls are when something happens to one of the members that you have to laugh at, kind of, uh, you know, like the lieutenant said, uh, that dog barking, don't worry. That those dogs don't bite. And then next thing you know, the dog was attached to his arm. And none of us really could hide the laughter when he was trying to shake this German Shepherd off of his turnout coat uh, after saying, dog won't bite. <laughs> Swing to miss, he struck him out. Fourth. Sense of humor in the fire department. You have to listen to this. The old saying goes, if you don't laugh, you'll cry. So, you know, you have to have that kind of sense of humor in order to get by. Fourth, favorite bar or restaurant in New York City. Wow. You know, that I don't want to, uh, uh, I, I guess I'd have to, I have a few, you know, and in, in, in Queens, the Parkside, which I've been going to for many years in Corona. Uh, in Manhattan, you know, I like uh, Sestina and Douay and, and a few others, certainly Felidia, uh, up. Lydia's closed, the Primola. I like Italian restaurants usually. I don't blame you. I like Italian food myself. And fifth and finally, uh, you know, if you can grab, it, speaking as Commissioner Nigro, if you can go back in time and speak to Proby Nigro, fresh out of the academy, given all your experiences, what would you tell Proby Nigro? 
I think the best advice they can we can give to our young firefighters is each and every minute of each and every tour be prepared because things happen rapidly and unpredictably and if you are prepared you can handle them if you're unprepared uh, bad things can happen so be prepared each and every day and enjoy each and every day of the job if you enjoy it as much as I have over my career uh, you'll retire a very I love it. Uh, Chief, before I say goodbye to the audience, is there any shout outs you want to give to anyone or anything? Uh, no, I think I'll, uh, I'd, I'd miss people if I did. I have, uh, I think the people, people I've worked with over the years, uh, I, I care deeply about and I wish them well. Those who are still working, I wish them well. Those who, who are retired, who retired before me, I wish them a uh, long, healthy, happy retirement. Amen. Well, even like I said at the top, even though I didn't get him first, you know, Lou and Kevin had to steal him from me. I did get him. So I thank you for coming on, Commissioner. Stick around. We'll say goodbye off the air. Coming up next in the Mike the New Haven podcast, he was also John Latanzio, if you're still watching, your buddy coming on this Monday, 6 p.m. sharp. It's going to be volume 21 of the E-Men inside the NYPD's emergency service unit. He was originally with the housing police and their emergency rescue unit. And then he went on to the NYPD after the merger, worked in three truck in the Bronx and was shot in the face in the 2000 shootout with an EDP, emotionally disturbed person. But he survived to live to tell the tale. Joe Guerra will join me, of course, for volume 21 of the E-Men inside the NYPD's emergency service unit. In the meantime, on behalf of Commissioner Dan Nigro, this has been volume 24, the best of the bravest interviews with the FDNY's elite. I'm Mike Cologne. Have a great weekend, everybody. We will see you next time. Stay low and go, baby. Thank you.